Hey, KU fans, welcome back to the KU Sports Hour here at KUSports.com with Benton Smith, who just a little while ago was covering an undefeated football team. What a run it was. I'm Matt Tate, and I'm covering a one and two football team. Benton, surprised? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I mean, I, I think everybody probably thought that KU football would be one and two after three games, just based on the schedule and how it was going to play out. Um, I know some people were kind of down on Baylor heading into this season and kind of e maybe even, I mean, I was more optimistic about how that KU Baylor game would be last week heading right. into it for sure. I, I thought it would actually be pretty competitive, but um, you know, it, it really got out of hand quickly in that third quarter, obviously 14, seven at halftime. That's which was kind of shocking because it wasn't like KU played well in the first Not half. Not at all. Um, right. But they, they got some, some breaks with a, a big takeaway and, and then, you know, got one good looking offensive drive. Uh, but I mean, that was, that was the big issue. Like, I mean, that was it. That was the right. drive of the game. Nothing else was even close to like attractive or sustainable <laughs> offensively in, in that game. Um, and then obviously Baylor out physical, uh, Baylor offense out physical the KU defense, um, you know, just kind of manhandled them a little bit. Um, so it, it, that's, that's definitely what I, I wasn't expecting it to be that bad. Um, I, I know some people probably were and, sure. you know, good for you. If you, if you thought, if you were super pessimistic going into the game, I guess you were right. It paid off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, uh, you know, I was walking around the, the stadium before that game and, and just kind of listening. I, I, every once in a while I do that, not every game, but I, I like to do that to try to get a feel for what people are feeling, right? Like the, the fans. Mm -hmm. And I think that we woke up Saturday morning or even Friday night. People were like, hey, you, you heard it here first. KU's winning this game. I mean, that might have been alcohol induced. prediction. <laughs> I don't I don't know, but I heard that a lot, way more than I expected. Yeah. And then and then as I walked around the stadium to try to kind of get a feel for what the vibe was there on game day, it was it was it was less that and more kind of what you said, like a little optimism that the, this would be a game. Um, you know, a lot of people were just saying, I heard a few people say, well, as long as it's not like last year. And then it was, you know, according to the score, worse than last year. So I think last year was what, 42, 14 or something. And this was that 45 right. seven. That, that also feels like five years ago. So I'm right. trying to, right. to like think about it off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt. No doubt. So, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the obvious thing that played out in that game was the fact that by late third quarter and really all of the yeah. fourth quarter, it was completely empty stadium. Once again, I mean, mm -hmm. nothing but bleachers and concrete and, as much as, you know, I've been, a, I've been banging the drum for, Hey, KU fans, you got to show up. You got to support this, this rebuild. You got to support the, the the program and the department for potential realignment stuff. I mean, I, I've been, I've been high on that and, and harping on that, but I don't blame them for leaving that game. It was over. They showed up. I mean, I think there's a difference, right? That, like yeah. they showed up and, and, mm -hmm. and they showed they're willing to, to watch and willing to come out and support. But if at that point it becomes just a game that's not in doubt at all and, you know, it's a nice afternoon and you got something better to do, then, I mean, what's the point of staying and rooting for your team to come back from four touchdowns down with eight minutes to go? I mean, I just – I don't blame them. So I didn't mean to make this sort of a tangent on, on the crowd again, but, but I think that it's important to point that out. Like these people are showing up and, you know, they're not filling it 45,000 full, but no one expected that ever, but they're filling it to a point of respectability and they're showing up to support it. And it's up to KU now to keep that. And, and for, for a half they did. And I, I think you nailed it. They didn't play very well and somehow we're in that game. And, and so maybe that was a little bit of fool's gold. Well, I think, I think that's down bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's kind of what um, they're doing, the kind of things you have to do in this position to, to kind of be competitive. Um, they'll, I mean, they're, they're not making horrible mistakes on offense to right. lead to turnovers. Um, they're, they're at least competitive enough defensively where, you know, they're, they're creating a takeaway every now and then. Um, and I mean, th that's other than like the offense going three and out so many times, um, that's kind of the, the recipe you need to be competitive when you're at this stage of the rebuild. I mean, you obviously need longer offensive drives to kind of 
eat up the clock and stuff like that. So that wasn't happening, but um, we saw some of that and we saw definitely saw more explosive plays when they were at coastal Carolina. Um, right. But that Baylor game was just a, a whole other animal as far as like the, the type of athletes they were going up against. And I don't know. I, I mean, I, I asked Andy Cole Nicky if that was kind of a, a wake up call for players and he, he didn't go that far, but he said there were a lot of kind of like aha moments, right? Sure. Like, all right, sure. you know, what I'm doing is not going to cut it. Um, I've, I've got to be better. And, and, and obviously and I think we've, we've heard this for years with KU football is like, there's, there'll be a different guy having a different mistake on, on every play. And it, it just kind of adds up and you never get going. Um, so obviously that's, that's something that they need to address and that they, they are addressing. Yeah. Good point. That, that last part's very important. They, 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 these guys know what they're doing. They had what, 14 missed tackles. Um, but, but in order to miss a tackle, you got to be there to make the tackle. And so I think there's a lot of situations, especially defensively where these guys are in the right positions. They're just not finishing the play. They're not executing. And so the coaches are putting them in the right positions. Not all the time, of course, but right. more often than we've seen in the past, I think that's happening. And so now it's, it's be physical, be aggressive. Um, you know, don't lay back and, and let it come to you, go make the play. And, you know, and sometimes you just get beat, right? Like, I mean, sometimes a receiver or running back just puts a move on you. That's better than you have. And there's, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's going to happen, but 14 times too many, um, like you said, that third quarter, it, it just got out of hand. Um, they did the, the offense, you mentioned them the, uh, kind of limiting or, or avoiding mistakes. They did turn yeah. it over for the first time this season. Right. In yeah. But I mean, like fourth quarter, they, they did, totally they did. Over. The game was over. The game was all but over at that point. You know, you got your, at that point, your third string running back, uh, it had got his, you know, got hit and lost the ball. And, but I who, mean, who, who fumbled? Amari Pesa kicks in. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Right. So he, that was kind of his first, like first, like lengthy appearance uh, right. of the season as he's kind of worked his way back from an injury and um, not, to, I mean, I'm not making excuses for the guy or for the turnover, but I mean, you almost not made really. it through three games without a, without a turnover. So yeah. I, to me that you're doing a, a pretty good job with that. Totally agree. And, and I wanted to, I, I, I couldn't remember who fumbled, but I wanted to bring up the running back position. Cause obviously yeah. that was the big news of the week, right? Yeah, that, uh, yeah definitely. That, Velton Gardner's left the team, entered the transfer portal. Um, this is your top returning rusher. Um, this is your starting tailback. This is yep. your most experienced runner. Mm -hmm. And a guy who also, I, I felt, got plenty of opportunities this year in, in the, mm -hmm. the two games or three games. Especially in the opener. Right. In South Dakota. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, whether that's the O-line not creating opportunities – for him to make big plays and gain big yards or him not seeing it or a combination of both or whatever it is. I don't really care because he got the touches, he got the mm -hmm. carries and I don't, we don't know. I mean, we'll, you know, we probably will never know why he, why he decided to leave. Maybe it was uh, maybe there's more to it than football. Um, maybe it was just uh, uh, wanting a fresh start. Maybe it was, I mean, he's obviously going to have a chance to preserve that red shirt now. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that could go into it, but Aside from the, the the why and all that, what do you make of his departure? I mean, what do you, what do you think? Because going into the season, this was a pretty deep position. This was arguably their best position, and and one of those things where you kind of had a luxury uh, of of talented backs. And now with Highshaw out for the year and and Val Gardner gone, you're you're down. Um, yeah. I still think it's a pretty good position, though. I mean, that you mentioned Pesic Hickson, I. I think the guy's got a ton of talent. He's got to get healthy. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they're in dire straits here. I don't think, oh, no, Velton Gardner's left. It's, uh, we're devastated. I mean, of course they would have rather kept him, but I don't, yeah. I don't think this is nearly the devastating thing that maybe some of the fans are, are seeing at face value because of his status and his known you know, history and track record and, and the fact that he's a name people knew. So what, what, do, you, what do you make of where they go from here uh, at running back? Well, obviously they're – they're pretty fortunate that they've, they've already kind of invested some development time into Devin Neal. Um, right. And that's obviously their, their top recruit from this, this 2021 or uh, class. So, I mean, it's, it's not like they didn't expect big things for him. Uh, maybe his, his timeline is kind of jumped forward significantly. Right. Because um, you know, coming into the year, we obviously thought Belton Gardner would be the, the number one running back and, week one, Devin Neal was, was barely involved, you know, right. I mean, he had one carry and it was, you know, late in the game. So I, I think that 
that Devin Neal did enough in the preseason that the coaches kind of trusted him and um, he kind of proved himself and what he's kind of committed to do. And I mean, the, the staff loves him. Teammates love him. Um, he's just, you got to remember sometimes that he's, he's still a, a true freshman. He's a young guy. And sometimes it takes, takes time to, to really get going, but he's, he's off to a pretty decent start. I think, I mean, he's definitely been their best running back so far. I mean, there's, sure. there's no question about that. And, and that, that includes him barely being involved in week one. Um, so I think that they're in a pretty good spot that, you know, they trust Devin Neal. He's a guy who seems like he can handle this role and you have Amari Pesa kicks in kind of getting healthier. Um, and that's, that's really been the, the only issue with him the past few weeks, right. is, you know, uh, is he good enough to go in games has been kind of hit and miss. Um, so you have potentially two pretty solid guys. Uh, I think what, what made Belton Gardner different was just his open field speed. Mm -hmm. um, now he was having issues getting to that, getting to those spots. I mean, I think he maybe had one solid run at Coastal Carolina where he actually, you know, kind of was able to get out on the edge and, and show off his athletic ability. And that maybe went for 18 or 20 yards or something like that. But those are the kind of runs we've kind of expected to see from him uh, just based on what he's done in the, the past two years. But they, they weren't happening. Um, I, I happen to think that over time he would have figured it out and sure. um, he would have been productive. So that, that to me is why it's kind of a pretty big blow, you know, regardless of what he'd done this year, which wasn't much. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. And, and I mean, the last thing you want to do is take those, those, you know, the versatility away. Right. And now, now they don't really have a burner at running back. I mean, right. they, they've got, you know, Pesta Kickson's a big dude and he, he's a punishing yeah. runner. He likes to, he's got speed. He's got probably the, I don't know if he's faster than Devin or not. I, I mean, I would, I would guess he probably is, but, um, but then with Tory Lachlan moving there too, again, I mean, he's played there in the past, but now it's like there, that's his position. He's not going to be a quarterback ever again in the history <laughs> right. of the world. Remember that ever again in the history of the world. So, but he's another big dude. Right. And I mean, I think a yeah. lot of the reason he's played early is, his ability to stay in there and pass protection and stuff like that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's obviously opportunity for him now, but yeah, they don't have, they don't have a burner. Is there, is there, I mean, is there anyone else that they could, you know, move to that, to that position just for some speed? Have you thought of that? I mean, is it, I haven't that, obviously. No, I mean, I think, I think they're definitely like another injury or something away from having to, to take that route. Um, right. Uh, I think these are their, these are their three guys at this okay. point that, yeah. that they're going to, they're going to roll with unless, you know, something drastic happens or you have to adjust because of an injury or that, that type of thing. I think moving forward, it's, you know, Devin Neal, Pesa Kixon and, and Tori Lachlan. And sure. you kind of see how, see how those guys handle w what they're able to get. And I, I think Cole Nick, you made a good point today while we were talking to him. Um, you know, one of the issues with these running backs is like, they aren't having drives that last more than four or five plays. So right. you're, I mean, you're, you're not even like really getting these guys many opportunities to, to go and, and do what they're capable of. Um, so obviously a lot goes into that, but um, if the offense can just make some progress, you know, potentially you can, you can really involve all three of those guys. Sure. And, and the other factor, I mean, I mean, I brought up speed, but they have speed with someone who can run the ball. Yeah, he's a quarterback. To beat their quarterback. Yeah, <laughs> so so it's probably not as dire um, right. yeah. to find that. I mean, and you know, there's other things you can do. Obviously, offensively, they could they could run some reverses and get maybe Kwame Lasseter the ball it, that way or something like that. I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. options are obviously all over the place when it comes to calling plays on offense. But but yeah, I mean, I think from losing Highshaw and now a guy leaves midseason to still have Devin Neal and Pesa Kixon and, and a guy like Lachlan who they can trust in there and throw out there. I mean, you would think of the running back room would be in way worse shape, but it's, yeah, you know, they're actually surviving this um, in a very <laughs> weird way. And, and, and getting back to Devin, man, I mean, like Devin Neal is exactly what this program needs. He's a talented dude who has a ton of potential, who has the absolute right, mindset and outlook mm -hmm. i mean he's positive he's a terrific teammate he believes in himself and others um he's going to put in the work to, to to build this thing and and you know there's a lot of other guys that, that that are that same way on this on this roster but you never have enough of them you know and and so i think it's a you know maybe a little bit of a blessing in disguise because as he now moves forward and, and has this 
bigger role or at least the opportunity for a bigger role, his voice can be heard a little bit more, right? I mean, he can become a leader of this team and, and that positivity and that grinder mentality that he possesses that he's always had, just how he's made, um, you know, how he's wired. I mean, I think that's a crucial part of, of what they need in this rebuilding process. So it's got to happen. He's got to go out and deliver. He's got to perform and produce and, and, you know, all those things need to be a part of it. He'll still be who he is, even if he doesn't, but I think for it to, for, for it to matter, for guys to hear it and, and maybe follow his lead a little bit, I think he's got to put up numbers and, and, and production. And, and I think he will. I mean, you, you said you thought Gardner would figure it out. I, well, I think the opportunity is there for, for Devin Neal to do the same thing. I mean, he's played exactly 3.01 college football games or 2.01 <laughs> college football games in his life, you know? So yeah. he's just going to get better and better and better as it continues to go. So um, th- that, that's exciting. And they're very fortunate to, to have a, a departure like that and to be able to kind of say, okay, well, let's roll. We've still got guys. And, and, you know, that wouldn't be the case at every position on, on right. this team or a bunch of other teams. So yeah. um, very interesting. How big is this game this week? I mean, not, not just for the program, not just for the rebuild, but, but for the fans, for, for the psyche. I mean, for, for, you know, everything. I mean, that this is a, this is a game that, Again, they're on the road, but they went down to Coastal Carolina and were competitive, and that's mm-hmm. a team ranked in the top 15. Duke's not ranked in the top 15. Duke's right. not as good as Coastal Carolina or Baylor. Okay. So logic says they should be able to go down and compete with these guys. I mean, I don't know anyone's going to pick them to win, but could you be competitive? And, and if so, I mean, how important is that for, for where they're at right now, three games into this Lance Leipold era? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's that's that's hugely important. Just to uh, you talked about psyche and kind of like progress and all those things. I mean, yeah. you've you you definitely need a, a game where you're competitive again after uh, how that Baylor game went. Um, so this it, it might be good timing because you know after this you got to go to Iowa State and obviously that's one of the premier programs in the Big Twelve right now and. Um, you know, winning on the road in the Big 12. I think we all know how that usually goes for, for KU football. So, uh, I mean. <laughs> Could you hey, give they, us a quick synopsis, though? I mean, like, <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, KU went to an ACC team and or played at an ACC school and, you know, won at Boston College kind of right. out of nowhere. Um, I don't know that you're necessarily expecting that this week, but um, I, I do think that it, Again, I, maybe I'm I'm too positive, but I do think it should be more competitive. Because, um, like <laughs> like you mentioned, like Coastal Carolina, that was such a veteran offense. Uh, uh, Baylor had such you know such a veteran big offensive line, and right. um, Duke Duke does some things with tempo that are pretty interesting offensively. Where you know they're going to try to like wear you out defensively. Um, I think Brian Borland said they had like 103 snaps or something last week. Insane, something. man. Yeah. That's Texas Tech, Baylor, mm-hmm. Heyday, Cliff Kingsbury, Art Riles fast. Yeah. And that's yeah. Gundy fast. That's crazy. So that's that's gonna be probably the the bigger challenge for for the defense. Um, but I, I do think because KU already has has been the the kind of defense that subs a lot of guys in in and out, especially on the defensive line. Um, I don't think that they should they should have too many issues as far as like, you know being conditioned for that or you know right. being, obviously, obviously they're prepping for that tempo at practices this week so I think that's probably the the biggest thing they'll have to overcome I think that's good that they're not going to have to overcome oh man we're playing this veteran offensive line with huge dudes that you know are just want to run it you know down our throats it's right. kind of a, a different deal you're heading into um and obviously uh, Duke Duke lost to Charlotte in the opener uh, they've kind of recovered since then but I mean to me, it's it's a much more winnable game than you had even at even the last couple of weeks, you know. So, I, I, I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it to be interesting again. I mean, they like like they they've talked about the past couple of weeks. You're you're down a touchdown and in the third quarter at Coastal, you're you're down a touchdown early in the third quarter against Baylor um, before things fall apart. So, uh, obviously, they've they've been talking about how they need to finish games and they're trying to find ways to do it and maybe, you know, this is a, a, another step in that progress is having a competitive game in the third quarter and then carrying it even deeper into the game so that, you know, you actually have a chance in the fourth quarter too. 
Yeah, I think that's huge. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's, there's some, there's some just organic progress there, right? Like, well, mm-hmm. hey, we've been into the third, so let's get one to the fourth. And, and I think if they can do that, even if they lose, or even if they lose by 14 in the fourth quarter, if they can get it there, then that's reinforcing the idea of, okay, we're making progress, right? Whereas obviously the Baylor game was a setback, regardless of, of whether they were in it or not. Uh, at any point, it was, yeah. it was a 45 to seven loss. You're not, no one's going to look at that and say, Hey, thumbs up, buddy. You know, right. <laughs> that's a setback. And, and I, I actually asked Leipold that earlier in the week and, you know, he, he admitted, he said, yeah, I think because of the way it kind of fell apart, it, this one stings a little bit more. And, and, and so, so now you got to go get it back, you know, but, but if you have two in a row like that, then that sting hurts even more. And then you're going into big 12 play where there's just no days off and it's a nightmare opponent every time you go out there and that kind of thing. And so it doesn't look great for the rest of the year, but if you can kind of steady things this week, and be in this game and get it to the fourth quarter. Like I said, even if it's uh, even if you lose by two touchdowns in the fourth, well, you got there and you were in it. And now that makes you feel like that, that big picture of progress is actually still at play. And, and I think that's going to be so important for this team and, and this coaching staff and this program, because that's what they've been preaching. Right. I mean, it's been, it's been a, a this is a process. This is a slow and steady build. It's not going to happen overnight. You got to, you got to hang in there and, and dig your heels in and just work. And, and so they've got to see along the way, some sort of sign that that work is being worth it, right. That that work is paying off even on the smallest of levels. So I think this game's huge. I think it's a massive game for the fans. I mean, I think you're talking mm-hmm. about like they don't play again at home until October, what, 16th or something. So they go, mm-hmm at Iowa state by weekend yeah. at home again. Right. Yep. So, um, I mean, at that point, that's, that's almost a month away and, you know, basketball, everybody knows October 1st is late night. And so you want to show the fans there's reason to come back out on October 16th and, and show up for that game because they have shown up as we mentioned at the beginning of this, they have shown that they're willing to come watch this team and support it. And so even, even though that's such a small part of the, the equation, I think that what they do down there at Duke this week is, is a factor in that, in that part of this. And, and even though people might not be able to watch um, it's on the ACC network. And, and I did look it up a little bit ago. There's some free trials and such. You can stream it. Um, you know, it sounds like ACC network has a, has a big 12 now sort of streaming service kind of um that, that's that's a free streaming thing if you sign up for it there's uh i don't know f-u-b-o fubo is that how you pronounce that i think so okay Sounds right thanks yeah i was thinking of fubu the uh, apparel line and so i just yeah. got, got my head mixed up but fubo also has a free trial um if you want you know you can sign up for that and then cancel it and grab a little ACP <laughs> network flavor for a week or whatever it is but yeah. i mean you know, and, and even if not, you can follow along with Benton's coverage and follow along on Twitter and, and still be enough engaged in what's happening down there to kind of get a feel for how they play, how they look. Is it worth it? What do they, where do they go from here? So anyway, it'll be interesting to see what, how that factors in. But, um, I, you know, Benton, I, I guess before we wrap it up here, what, what are you looking at this week? I mean, we've talked about the magnitude of it and and kind of where they're at, but, but what, what do you think will be, and not necessarily the biggest key to whether they can be in the game or not, but just what's, what's the story with this team right now? Where are you watching most closely to just to kind of see how they're, how they're able to move forward and, and if they're going to have success in that area, I mean, is there one or is it a couple or what? Well, I mean, you, you almost could go anywhere, you know, just yeah, based true. on how, how poorly last week went against Baylor. But true. I mean, th- to me, the, the offense really has to have a big bounce back because, I mean, they, they literally only had like one drive that was yeah. worth anything, you yeah. know, uh, in that entire Baylor game. Um, and then they even had that's that was one of the probably the more discouraging things for the players and coaches was, was they opened the third quarter with the ball. Right. And they went three and out and then Baylor scored and then they went three and out again. Um, so uh, to me, the, the offense has to, you know, find ways to, you know, keep, keep improving with that offensive line and, you know, what they're doing up, up front, obviously, and because it, it starts there. And, you know, if, if you're able to do anything, it's, it's going to be because your line is winning some battles and, you know, uh, 
Jason Bean, I think, showed at Coastal Carolina that he can do a lot of things when they're actually sustaining possessions, you know. Um, he's, he's a guy who can make plays under pressure, um, can kind of scramble and do something that's, you know, kind of no one is expecting, but he re- reads it and reacts it and something good happens. Um, we didn't see a lot of that against Baylor. Um, and I think that's, that's another thing that you just got to, you got to move past this. And um, because the offense was so bad, I, that's probably where I'm looking most is like, how, how did they respond? You know, what, what did they do preparation wise that will help them kind of get back to where they were at least in that, that, cause that coastal Carolina game was, was pretty entertaining. Sure, um, sure. I know, I know it got away from them late, um, but I mean, there were a lot, there were downfield plays where Bean was hitting receivers, you know, and he was taken off for runs of 15 and 20 yards. And um, that's, that's what you got to get back to. There wasn't any of that against Baylor. Yeah. Great point. And obviously the important part of that is you mentioned the O-line that that's, that that's all of it almost because yeah. these big 12 teams moving forward, mm-hmm. they're not going to let Jason Bean beat them right. uh, or, or even have any room to breathe. You know, the, the, they're going to look and they're going to say, well, there's the one guy we have to stop. And so we will scheme and, and game plan to do that. And then if we do, we'll win easy. And, and so, you know, you can't just say, well, let's, let's see what Bean can do. Cause we know what he can do. I think you nailed it. I mean, I, I think the guy is, is crazy talented. I think he's still raw and still inexperienced, but getting better and more comfortable every week, he can make plays with his legs. He can make plays down the field. I think you said his pressure moments too. I mean, he makes some clutch throws where he looks supremely relaxed. I mean, and and I think that's a big part of the reason he can make those throws. He just kind of drops sets and just releases. And, and he looks like he doesn't even know there's a rush coming. I mean, now the, the idea is find that on every play, but, but again, it's not there every play. You've got to have mm-hmm. your offensive line hold up and, and, and they're still banged up. Colin Grunhard's out at least another couple games. And, and um, you know, he's by no means the best lineman in the country or anything like that, but he was the guy repping with the ones all August um, and, and him being out's forcing them to kind of move around. Right. So I, th- I think, you know, that's something that it's not just, well, when he comes back, it'll be better. It might, but he's also going to be coming back off injury and he's not going to be back anytime real soon until probably yeah. after the bye week Right. So, right. Um, so, you know, you got to figure out a way to find, find somebody or some bodies who can do the job up there and, and allow Bean to, to be a factor because otherwise mm-hmm. teams are just going to game plan on him and, and, and that won't work too. So that, that falls on the line that falls on Devin Neal um, that, that falls on the receivers getting separation. I mean, I, th- I think you're right. They, everybody knows that in order to be competitive in the big 12, you can't average 17 points a week. And I don't even know if they're averaging that right now. They can't be right. No, it's, it, I think it's like 15 and a point six or something yeah. like that. Okay. Remember so, that. yeah. So anyway, you, you got to score more than two touchdowns you got to score more than probably four touchdowns really to be competitive. So go find a way. And uh, this could be a big confidence game for that too. I mean, I, I do think, you know, real quick, let's finish it up here. I mean, what, what, what have you seen week to week to week with Bean? Because um, I, I, I get, I mean, I do get the feeling that this was kind of a close race and, and that <laughs> he wasn't just the guy all the, all the way at all. But my God, they definitely made the right choice. And that's not a knock yeah. on the other guys. This guy's just talented. I mean, he is very talented. So what 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 have you seen week to week to week that 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 you like? And and how how realistic is it that that can continue? I, I do like kind of the uh, the trajectory that he's that he's on. Like you mentioned, like he kind of took off in the the preseason in that race and kind of has been building off of that. Um, sure obviously the, the Baylor game wasn't anything, you know, impressive uh, from Bean, but to me, that was also like by far like his, his biggest test as far as like, you know, the Baylor secondary had like experienced big 12 defensive backs, you sure. know I mean? They, and they, they had guys that have played in the big 12 games, you know, Bean Bean is still new to the big 12. He played at North Texas. Um, he wasn't facing these kind of athletes every week. I think South Dakota and coastal Carolina, uh, defensively were probably a little bit more similar to, to what he was used to facing. So maybe he was a little bit more comfortable. Um, yeah, he, he definitely needs to have another big week for, for KU to be competitive uh, in this Duke game. And, 
And like we kind of alluded to earlier, it's, it's going to get more difficult moving forward. So I think that's why it's even more important that you kind of like, you, I mean, because if you have a rough game at Duke, maybe, you know, the, the confidence uh, takes a hit or, you know, the, the progress is going, the, is, is going backwards instead of forward. And, and then, you know, where are you at when you're playing at Iowa State? And uh, that's going to be such a tough game, uh, you know, because they're doing, I mean, that, that program has been rolling the past few years. Yeah, well, good call. And I, I think, obviously, Bean has said it, you know, he would like to do more than just make plays with his legs. Mm -hmm. And that seems like the easiest way to kind of hope for him to continue to progress right now because he's so fast. He gets to the edge so quickly, and when he hits the seam, he, he can be gone. But they, if they want to be competitive, they need him to stay in there and be protected and throw the ball down the field because there are guys that can make plays down there, as you mentioned at Coastal Carolina. That, that can happen. It's, it's just sort of got to be a perfect storm right now, right? Like everything yeah. has to come together. you got to get the protection. He's got to see it. Guys have to run their routes and get separation, and then it's got to be delivered on time and all that stuff. And, and God, easier said than done. And, yeah. and I got exhausted just saying, so <laughs> imagine trying to do it with, uh, with live action flying all around you. So um, big week for Bean, big week for, for Lance Leipold, big week for Cole Nicky and Brian Borland. I mean, there's, there's a lot at stake for all of those guys. And obviously for Kansas as well, uh, I think it's maybe a two touchdown underdog somewhere in there. And uh, that's probably about right. So it'll be interesting to see if they can hang closer than that, or maybe even get to position to be in the fourth quarter to have a shot to win. I mean, that, that would be massive. It would be massive. Even though Duke's, you know, very average, it would still be a massive, massive outcome and result. So we'll see what happens. Benton will be down there back home for Benton. ish <laughs> a little North Carolina uh, time in his life as a resident yeah. of that great state. Uh, Definitely went to UNC. So enemy territory, even you could say this week. <laughs> From your Tar I guess Hill, you could say that. Tar Heel loving days, <laughs> um, which are now long, long gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it'll be a, it'll be a good trip. I uh, I definitely remember the last KU at Duke trip, and uh, they got absolutely annihilated. What was it, forty-one to three or something like that? Three or six, but I think three is probably right. Yeah, um, yeah. and and it was the same. It was weird because it was the same feeling. I remember previewing that game um and and kind of feeling like well they could be in this game you know this is a big one and then they weren't man the, i don't even remember the running back's name maybe he went on to do something maybe he didn't but he was a freshman and he just he just kept running and kept running and said you know uh, one of those guys that's one of those many guys that set a record against the kansas <laughs> defense uh, it was a duke freshman record i think so nothing nothing national or historic in that regard but still i just pulled it up Sean Wilson broke the, the school's single game rushing record with 245 yards. There you go. <laughs> by the way, he was a freshman. <laughs> by the way, I never heard from him again. Right. I mean, yeah. he's not, he's not an NFL back right now, you know, nothing like that. So yeah. Uh, crazy, crazy deal. I remember talking to Shane Zinger before the game. He had a, he had a, he had a, he had a vision <laughs> for how this whole thing was going to go. And if this, this, and this went right, they could win this game. And, you know, he was wrong. I was wrong that, 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 that they could be in it. I mean, it's just, it's, it's well, did, wild. Didn't they fire Weiss a week later? Uh, did they? Maybe. I think that's the wrong season. Is it? They fired Weiss after the Texas game at home where they did mm -hmm. not score, <laughs> which was the most, the most just poetic thing, right? This offensive <laughs> yes. guru, his last game, zero points and see ya. <laughs> I don't think it was that because I think they beat Central Michigan and moved to two and one and then lost to Texas and moved to two and two. And that was his final straw. And then Bowen took over the rest of the way. So, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Here we go. Got it. 2014 week two at Duke lost oh, okay. 41 to three next game beat Central Michigan. Okay. And then the following week shut out against Texas. Okay. So, so two weeks later, yeah, you, two were, weeks close. Later. you were close. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and uh, wow. I didn't realize that was that close together. I mean, um, many, many years ago now, thankfully, sadly, all of the above. Who, who, who fires two and two. That's it. That's it. There you go. Right. Yeah. So, 
Oh gosh, good call. So yeah. So anyway, let's see if this KU Duke reprise can go better than that one did, both for the program, for the stat sheet, and for the head coach. <laughs> Something tells me Lance Leipold's going to be around a long time, regardless of what happens. More than two more weeks, you think? Is that, yeah. The safe money. Okay. Safe. Good. Good. Super safe. I like that. I like that. Uh, well, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. I, I continue to think, and we'll kind of end it here, but I continue to think this is a, a guy that knows what he's doing. He's 100% committed to this, this project. And uh, I think this team continues to get better as the year goes on. It, it may be hard to see. It may not show up in all the ways the fan base wants it to show up. But I, I, I just think that when you coach it and approach it the way that him and his staff do, it's really hard to not get better. I mean, you might not get better quickly enough for it to matter just yet, but it's really hard to not get better. I mean, they, they have a plan, they have a system, they've stuck to it and they will continue to do that regardless of what the scoreboard says. So if nothing else, you know, take some joy in that because that's how you have to do it. You have to get started somewhere and, and that's the best place. Benton, final thoughts, maybe about North Carolina. Are you going to go see a Durham Bulls game? What are you going to do when you're down there? Well, we're still in a pandemic, so it's not the most exciting trip to North Carolina <laughs> for fair, me, uh, but I do have some some friends and my brother lives down there. So uh, hoping to to be able to, to see them in a safe and socially distanced type situation uh, outdoors. The weather should be beautiful, so that should be helpful. Um, so, yeah, that, that'll be fun for me. Um, but, you know, going back to what you're saying about about the fans and what, you know, kind of the big picture for this season, um, sure. I, I know it it has to suck if you're a KU football fan, because you keep hearing the same stuff about, well, you got to be patient. You know, this, right. this is a long process, but I, I do think, I agree with you. I do think they've, they've found the right guy for the job. Um, so, so maybe at least that is kind of like, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, like, you know, that, and I, I, I agree with you. I think they will continue to progress throughout the, make progress throughout the year. But the thing is that there, there are actually a lot of big 12 programs that are, that they're looking pretty good this season. So it's, that's what's going to make the wins hard to come by. Absolutely. Well said he's Benton Smith. I'm Matt Tate. He will be down at Duke's football stadium. Cameron Wallace Endor. Wade. All of that. Wallace Wade. Oh yeah, that's right. It's got a nice little ring to it mm -hmm. right next to Cameron Endor too. Pretty cool spot. Actually, it's a nice setting. So anyway, follow all of Benton's coverage from the game at KUSports.com. That's if you don't do the free trial of ACC Network. Even if you do, follow along with Benton. He's going to have tons of coverage, as we do every week. KU Duke, 3 p.m. Saturday afternoon in the final non-conference game of 2021. And then it starts to get really, really real. Thanks for checking out this episode of the KU Sports Hour. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Take care, everyone.